Hello and welcome to episode three of the New Music Podcast. I'm Jaden Slaughter, and today's guests are the duo Okapi. They're a really interesting band from Asheville, North Carolina, whose elaborate folk compositions are somehow evocative, yet also trance-like. At least that's the way I would describe it. I saw them play about a week before the pandemic hit last year and was blown away by just how different they sound, because I really don't have any like other band to compare their sound to. So I like to have the artists I have on introduce themselves. So, you know, tell, tell people your names, your pronouns, um, where you're at right now, what instruments do you play, that sort of thing, just the general stuff. Okay, sounds good. My name's Lindsay. Um, I identify as female and I play cello, have been since I was like seven. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I'm Scott. Um, I play the upright bass and I'll copy. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. And so for p- folks who are unfamiliar with your music, how would you describe it? I think it has, um, I think it has rock elements to it. And, but also like kind of a, a chambery uh, sensitivity to it as well. Um, I think we like incorporating um, something that's intimate with something aggressive. And I think that's what works really well with the acoustic instruments that we use. <laughs> um, but I mean, we listen to all different types of music. So yeah, it's kind of like a, let's say it's kind of like a chamber rock with like these avant-garde elements to it. it it's nothing like um, boundary pushing for the sake of pushing boundaries, but I think it does have something um, unique to it. Um, so yeah, avant chamber rock something in that yeah um, heavily driven by lyrics for sure got you so you guys finished recording an album last week right Mm -hmm. yeah so what was that process like it's crazy yeah it's stressful (laughs) um so yeah we like we um we met in chicago and so there's a, a studio that we really like up there called electrical audio that um when we met, you know, we had wanted to record there, but we couldn't afford it. Just when we were living in the city, it was just too much at the time. But um, so we kind of made it a point once we moved to Asheville and had a little bit more money to do that, to, to go back up and record. And that's what we did for part one. <clears throat> and then we just recorded part two. And uh, yeah, we just, we did that. We did um, the recording and the, and the mixing in four days. And then we just had another day of mastering while we were up there as well. So it was just, um, um, live musical takes um, and, and taking the best parts um, from those takes and then doing a couple of vocal takes and pretty simplistic. Um, yeah, just like a really dry recording. Yeah, straight kind of, to the point, no like flourishes or anything added in. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was just four days recording with um, Greg Norman, who is a freaking awesome beast. Um, I would re- refer him to anyone, you know, he's, he's amazing. And then um, a day with mastering um, with Bob Weston and yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. So we, uh, and then we had days in between those sessions to, you know, go to the art Institute and one of our favorite museums in Chicago. And then we went to the Warren dunes in Michigan to kind of break up the, just the, um, yeah. the headspace, you know, that comes with the recording where you're listening, you know, so attentively to everything and um kind of need a break from it after a while after yeah. you hear the same song a million times and it's funny <laughs> like um i i always want us to physically prep because we're trying to squeeze as many like takes into as short of a time as possible and so i don't want us to think like oh no i can't do another take because my body can't take that you know um but what really was getting me through the process was just the mental like getting over any sort of um, insecurities that I might have about the sound of my playing and just looking past that and trying to deeply analyze. And yeah, my, my brain was toast by the end of it. (laughs) So how do you, how do you move past the overanalyzing or, you know, 
as you were describing there to get where you need to be or want to be with the um, recording process or yeah. making the music. Totally. And I think that this might be more of a struggle for me than it is for Scott. Um, I started in a classical background and went to a conservatory for a year and a half and just was not jiving with um, the mentality, the strict mentality of that and their perspective of what music and art was, you know. And um, so it's it's been a constant struggle for me with not overanalyzing and picking things apart and just being like my own worst critic, you know? But I think one thing that's really helped is we both um, really appreciate like the anthology of American folk music. Um, just the rawness of old school music that was to convey a story or to, to just express themselves past time, anything. And it's not perfect. These people are never perfect with their singing, with their instruments. Like they probably hold it in a funky way. It's out of tune, but there's something so wonderful and pure about that, that I really appreciate. And then also with just the philosophy of the music and the lyrics, um, we, we don't want to promote something that's perfect. We want something that embraces human flaw and honesty and fragility. So trying to remind myself of all those factors and like, no, those are the things you appreciate. So why are you beating yourself up for them? That definitely, um, I, I was working on it. <laughs> I'm sure it's a process. Yeah. <laughs> Less attention paid to refinement. And I mean, yeah, it's embracing the vulner, you know, vulnerable state that we all are in. And, you know, even with live performances, it's, you know, you're, you're putting yourself out there and um, whether you like it or not, you're like being analyzed and, and judged to some degree, just, but, you know, based on what you're doing and that's mm -hmm. fine. And that's um, the space we like to put ourselves in and choose to put ourselves in. And yeah, I mean, with the recording, it's, you know, you, you prepare as much as you can and you do the best you can with the time that you have and, and you kind of just accept that, you know, despite mistakes or flaws that, that kind of appear. And I mean, you could spend your whole life um, um, polishing it as much as possible, you know, and but then it's it's still not an accurate representation of, of what you're doing as an artist. So yeah, we kind of live with the grit yeah. and kind of move past it. and that it, it sounds like us. So, you know, and that was the right. best that we can do. So if, if <laughs> anything, it's like a representation of just those three days that we recorded the music and the vocals. And that mm -hmm. was where we were at with those three days, you know? So it's kind of nice knowing that it's at least encapsulating something honest like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you said like in between the days of recording, you went out and were doing things like you went to the art museum and you went to the dunes but do you think those trips you had in between influenced the way you made the music in the studio at all? No, um, so yeah. the way the way it was at least laid out was we didn't have, we couldn't book um, five consecutive days. So we had um, a few days booked and then we had it broken up, whereas we didn't actually use one of the days and then the, the last day was mastering which you're kind of just listening to it you're not doing anything physical and so um when we had done those things we had already finished like the actual physical part of like recording the music and recording the vocals and so i think we were already a little bit at peace with everything so it was kind of just more enjoyment <laughs> and i think like you hear so many groups going into the studio not knowing exactly like what form even a song is going to take or just working on things while they're in there or like wait is that the note I'm supposed to play um and that's something that we've painstakingly gone through and like beaten our heads against a wall with for a while so everything's going to come out pretty much as we're wanting to it's just the execution and what sort of headspace we're in given um just environment and how anxiety is being channeled and all that. So yeah, those those meditating over lunch breaks and everything to try to keep myself in a good space. 
Yeah, I mean, we would like make our own lunches and stay in the space. I, I think too much separation can kind of break that chain of thought, which can, yeah. for me, can be dangerous. So um, for us, I feel like it's best to just kind of live in that space until you leave. Um, yeah, and just go really hard with it. Mm -hmm. which is yeah I think that's how we like to do it and it's much more affordable that way right <laughs> just kind of hitting it really hard and, and then leaving within a couple of days you know these really mm -hmm. crazy challenging important moments gone you know begin and then ending within a couple of days so yeah it's interesting mm -hmm. gotcha so how's the new album compared to your first album mm. so it's um a part two it's supposed to be a continuation and a reflection, but personally, like he's going to argue with us, but I think it has a bit more of a rock element to it. Um, it's just not quite as all over the place with time signatures. And um, that definitely wasn't the intent from him, but I think just kind of naturally came out. And also I think it's a, it has a little less hope, <laughs> which is, great promotion right there I think, right but. so like sound wise it's it's very similar um I mean we wanted the recordings to to sound almost exactly the same yeah. so um just because it was a continuation of the first part and so yeah actual like specifications with the recording were pr like pretty on point but um I, it's it's kind of just like yeah a, a revisitation of a headspace or a thought or or um just a perception of the world from the standpoint of the individual a few years down the line. And so there's, there are new perspectives that are kind of um, coming into the, that equation. And so I wouldn't say it's, you know, more bleak, but it is like a little bit more of a refined perspective. And, you know, it's, <clears throat> as you get older, it's like you start to kind of zone into your character a little bit more. You might not go out and explore things as much. You, you might take less risks. Um, you start to settle in. And so I guess in that sense, it might be a little bit more zoned in um, as far as perspective goes, but it's a little bit clearer too. Um, and that's a big difference too. Like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part one was written entirely in cities and part two has been here has yeah. been in Asheville North Carolina so um even just that difference I think is kind of huge yeah I think intentionally the first part there there was a lot more exploration going on with composition trying different things and I feel like the second part was um kind of capturing more of the direction that I was wanting to go into intentionally, um, at least at that point. And I mean, like we're already like halfway through the next album and, you know, have similar ideas and trying new things again. So I don't know, mm -hmm. the same and different. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, why did you make the first, when you initially released the first album, you know, part one is in the name. So I guess you intended on there being a part two so what, what went into, what was the thought process behind you, why you wanted the separation and making part one then part two down the line? I think a chunk of that had to do with the environment change. Cause I remember talking that over and being like, oh, well, Child Kingdom, which is on part two, wait, we, we wrote that while we were in New York. Oh, is that gonna be a different energy? Um, but as to like, why we knew that there were going to be two parts thank you i think for me at least i i know um i have a good idea of how long i'm gonna sit within a concept um and how much it needs to be explored and i i thought that like revisiting the the, the concept a few a few years down the line um would i i just didn't think that you know eight tracks could encapsulate everything that was going through my head or whatever and what we were trying to convey. And so it just made sense to, to have it as a part two. And I think it's, you know, each album we're kind of revisiting the thought of at least me, like quitting, just quitting music. It's just like, you know, too much effort and too much 
it's just really absurd with, you know, being a musician and trying to, to, to build a lifestyle around that. So you're like juggling the artist's lifestyle while juggling the lifestyle that's necessary to like pay rent and get groceries and, mm -hmm. and still have enough money to, to travel and try to do things that yeah. inspire the art. But, um, yeah, I think it was just a really big conceptual thing and knew that it would take up that much space. And I mean, around the time that it was, it was pretty soon after we recorded part one that we were already almost done with part two. And, you know, we were going, going to record it right when the pandemic hit. So we had a little bit more time to, to work on it and, and release it. I don't know or at least record it at an appropriate time where we could have a proper release and try to tour to promote it and everything. Yeah. So you say, you know, sometimes you feel the pull to, you know, kind of give up on music. So what brings you back to it and what makes you keep going for it? Um, Absurdity. <laughs> it's looking at the alternative and that not seeming as, yeah. as fruitful. I mean, I guess it always comes back to, well, this, this like brings me fulfillment, even if I'm really, really struggling mentally and, um, pushing myself physically and, and even just doing the social media and, and booking tours and, and, you know, taking off work to, to go on tour and seeing how, you know, figuring out ways where you can, you can compensate for that. And it's just a lot. And I think I'd still prefer that that um that really crazy um challenge of a of a lifestyle rather than have something a little bit more redundant or mundane and and have this guarantee all the time um because i think i have an artistic mindset that would constantly be going into like oh what can i do with this thing that i've learned or what a, how is what i'm reading you know influencing my perspective on something and i i'm always that's that's what makes life interesting for me is to kind of create something from what I'm gathering and, and what I'm um, absorbing from my environment. So I don't know. It's I guess the alternative I can't think of being <laughs> any better right now. So yeah, I think for me, like the biggest conflict with it is. Like you create art to understand what you're going through and to interpret your relationship to other people and to connect with people. And that's kind of the problem in itself too. The connecting with people can be such a struggle and even getting a show. And then if you get the show, are people going to be listening and are they going to understand how to connect to it? And so the struggle of like, no, I want to be able to communicate with you and people just being super overwhelmed by social media and Netflix and all these things that can just bombard our brains to where we can't take in any extra information. Like, I think that that's what really is the difficult thing for me. Because I, I, I want to be able to, to reach people and it, it seems difficult to reach, you know? You want to be that like salvation for, for people who need that, something like that, you know? Um, I would at least want somebody to stick their guns on what they're doing because there are people out there that are looking for something that's a little bit more insightful and, and challenging and... Um, you know, do it, do it for other people. If, if not for yourself, you know, even if <laughs> you don't know if those people exist. Right. <clears throat> so you talk about the difficulty of, you know, even getting shows like, so I know you've done a few since the, um, this past summer. So what's it like doing shows now in the COVID world? Yeah. So we haven't done any shows since this whole Delta variant thing has popped up um we have a tour coming up and so like it, we're hoping everything is going to be masked like vax cards required all of that we'll see what happens um but the ones before that we were doing house shows i think it's only been house shows and people have seemed extra open at these venues and um just pretty receptive I think there was only one where it might have just been kind of a like young awkwardness like I don't know how to interact sort of a thing that was going on 
Um, but otherwise people have been really enthusiastic. And then the other bands that have played, like just, you can tell how much people have missed this level of interaction. So I, I've loved it. It's been some of the better connections that I've had with performing. So, I mean, we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they went well, they went pretty well. Mm -hmm. So how did um, those shows and the interactions you had there compare to the shows you had prior to COVID? I guess, what was it like the before time? <laughs> yeah. I think it was just, I think it was just different circumstances that, that, you know, that kind of fed what Lindsay was saying where people were maybe had a, were much more, you know, introspective with their time and, and wanting to, to really immerse themselves into, into something that had meaning to it. And so, yeah, we're much more willing to interact um, with the music and, and with us and not having all the, the distractions I mean, where it's like, you could be going to like three or four shows a week, you know, before. And now it was, I think around those, those shows, it was a lot of, you know, people's first shows since the pandemic. And so there were really big turnouts for that. And yeah, a lot of enthusiasm. And so, mm -hmm. and I don't know, maybe, maybe our perform, maybe we felt the same way. Um, and that came through with our performances. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I think it was just circumstantial more than anything. Yeah. I, I, this might be kind of stupid. Um, but I, I do think that there was kind of this unbridled enthusiasm. Um, but maybe there's less judging because people are just so thankful to be out. And so there, I didn't feel as though there was as much of a, oh, is this cool? Or other people thinking this is cool? Is it okay for me to act like it's cool? I didn't pick up on that much at all. And um, I think it's really easy, especially if you are used to going out to whatever shows you want or just have tons of socializing going on to um, get so stuck in that current of trying to fit in or understand what other people are doing. And it seems like more so individuals were standing as opposed to like a crowd, you know? Or a crowd of individuals, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, much more open-minded and not, yeah, not too concerned with, is this gonna like, you know, help my status or like, is this something I should be going to? It, it just yeah. didn't feel that way. Everybody seemed pretty, pretty happy, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what sorts of bands do you guys normally share bills with? Because you seem to be, your sound seems to like occupy a somewhat unique space. So, I mean, do you, have, do you usually play with bands that are similar or vastly different in their sound compared to you? I think at this Pretty point, <laughs> I think at this point, for me, per, I mean, you limit yourself so much if you, if, for, for what we do, I mean, a lot of different bands have a lot of freedom, you know, they can choose anything, but um, it's been really difficult for us. And so we, we've kind of, um, you know, like beggars can't be choosers type of thing, but I, what's more important to me is the, the, the people, um, how you interact with the people and what type of people they are more so than the actual music they're creating. That's a, a lot more, I don't know, personal to me. Um, cause everybody expresses themselves in different ways and you can, find a group that is sounds similar, but they're coming from a completely different world where they, they might be really selfish or stubborn or unreliable. And so, yeah, just, it's so much more enjoyable just performing with people that you consider your friend, you know, um, despite what kind of music they might be making. Mm -hmm. And I, that kind of goes a long way also with, with booking the shows and, and, and touring, you know, where you, you're hooking back up with the people that you're friends with who are going to help you out and make sure it's a good show. And so it just makes so much more sense that way. And I'm fully supportive of having mixed bills anyway. That's what I would prefer to go and see. I don't, I don't want to see the, you know, three of the same type of group. For me, it's much more, and a lot of people have been saying that too. It's much more in interesting having like a mixed genre bill. But yeah, for me personally, I think it's just more so about the people themselves rather than the music they're creating. Right. And just 
pulling from my own background, this is definitely stereotyping and like in no way, shape or form everyone. But um, classical tends to be a little bit more stuffy, tends to have like a little bit of snobbery and competitive as far as the musicians analyzing each other and everything. And performances, like you shouldn't cough you shouldn't sneeze, you shouldn't do anything that's loud, holy shit, like that's too much, you know? Um, as, and then on the other side, there's rock music, which was what I listened to growing up and that's what I appreciate now a lot. And I, I think that there's just a looseness, there's, there's a willingness to um, enjoy something. And um, yeah, I, I just feel like it's a lot more open and so, us saying like, we only want to be on with like other string instruments or like only ex in experimental groups or anything like that would just steer us away from the people that we're trying to connect with. And I mean, you could, you could, I mean, it, it seems like it would make sense to, to try to, to have similar groups so that, you know, the, the audience might be more receptive to what you're doing, but I think it's more beneficial to, to be friends with everybody. And I feel like that, that has a higher likelihood of the people being open-minded to what you're doing, whereas they might not have gone to a, a show of yours otherwise. But since, you know, if you're going to a different city and you're playing with their friend's band, then all of a sudden there's like this, this new type of music, they're much more open-minded to it. And yeah, wouldn't have like sought that out on their own. And I mean, one of the ideal situations that we were in, it was like our first show back, but it, yeah, it was a house show. And, you know, things with rock music can go on the opposite end of the spectrum with, um, from what Lindsay was describing, where people aren't paying attention. It's just a party. Ah. People are disrespectful. Um, but this was like a really beautiful um, medium between the two where you had people that were just really excited and wanted to be there and getting into the music. But the, then, you know, when we would play, everybody was quiet and attentive. Yeah. Some people sat on the floor. And that was really beautiful to see in a, a completely packed house, mm -hmm. you know, without asking people to do that. They, they chose to, to react to it that way. And that's kind of the, the beautiful in between when you can find people that are open-minded and willing and non-judgmental, being attentive to what you're doing and actually listening to everything and appreciating mm -hmm. it for that. Yeah. So what sort of venues do you have booked for your upcoming tour? Mostly house shows again, right? Um, there's like a record store that we really like in, in Louisville. Um, yeah, some house shows in Chicago. Um, more, more like house shows, DIY spaces, not a lot of traditional like rock venues. Um, but yeah, all across the board, it's like a 10, 10 date tour. So kind of the um, Eastern Midwest area, I guess you could say, um, going up through Kentucky, to, to Chicago area, uh, Michigan, um, Western Pennsylvania, down through Ohio and back. So kind of that loop. Yeah, yeah I'll mostly DIY, DIY um, spaces or house shows, things like that. Mm -hmm. In hopes of, of having similar shows to the one that I just described, you know, yeah. just more of an intimate environment. Right. So you guys used to live in Chicago, right? Like years ago? Is that where y'all met? So what we left in? Um, yeah. yeah, I was just gonna ask, so what led to the decision to move to um, North Carolina? So we were in Chicago, like individually, we met towards the end of it um, for five years. And <laughs> um, I think we were just feeling kind of stagnant there. We didn't have enough money to like be able to go into or anything. And we didn't feel like um, the scenes we were in were pushing boundaries enough. It felt just like a lot of kind of garage rock, high school, that sort of thing. Um, so we were like, well, they're raising our rent. Let's move to New York. <laughs> so we were in New York for a year. And um, that was, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, challenging in so many ways, especially monetarily. 
but um, we moved pretty quickly with the scene there for being there for such a short period of time. But ultimately, like, just the expense and us being as sensitive of people as we are and living in some not great areas um, and working in some not great areas, that was just kind of tearing us down. Um, so we, why did we pick Asheville? Um, yeah, so I mean, and, um, <laughs> Chicago was just, it was challenging for us. It was, you know, beating our head against a wall. And I think we just, we had just wanted to try something different because we, we could, you know, we could try somewhere else. And um, yeah, Brooklyn like had a lot of really great things, but financially and um, lifestyle wise, it was really difficult. <clears throat> But um, we had camped out in the Smokies on like a road trip a few years prior to moving to Asheville. And it was kind of just in the back of my head personally, like I, I really, I read a lot about the, um, the acapella singers in Madison County and just kind of visualized it as this place I would maybe end up you know, further down the line. But um, we left Brooklyn pretty abruptly and just needed somewhere as a buffer. Like there wasn't any way that we were going back to our hometowns or anything like that to um, collect ourselves. It was just kind of like, well, we liked Appalachia. Let's, let's just park ourselves here and, and figure out what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think we just ended up falling in love with the environment itself much more so than than anything like Asheville like it wasn't just about the city that we were living in it was like everything that was around it and what a yeah. Appalachia kind of represented that that took hold of me personally and has kept me here and you know Asheville could just kind of like go away and to me it wouldn't like make any difference because I you know we've fallen in love with the mountains and the history and the fact that there's so much to learn out here and is and it's kind of given us peace of mind and inspired us. And so it's, you know, we kind of learned to not be as dependent on a sort of community from a city, but um, uh, taking more into consideration the environment that inspires the work that you're creating. And not only that, it's much more of, of you know, relatively affordable. Yeah. Um, to the point where, where you can at least have stable jobs that allow us to tour and have a car and and go on these tours and and not be completely broke from that yeah so it's it's just kind of an, an environment that that sort of works for us right now despite mm -hmm. Asheville not being re super receptive to what we're doing I mean that's like a whole other story altogether but um it is a really great place that we like being in as a home base, but we do, we do really like to tour anyway and travel. We're, we're not, we're not, we don't have these goals of being the biggest Asheville band or anything like that. When you say Asheville's not very receptive, that's a whole story unto itself. So what's the story there? <laughs> they're just not, I mean, there, there are, you know, there are always a handful of people. There are always, there are always exceptions to people that really click with what you're doing, but um, it's not really a sustainable environment for what we're doing. Because it's just like people just won't go to your shows. Or people they don't have as much interest in what we're doing. Um, and I, I mean, I've thought about it like so much. I, I don't understand why. Um, I stopped trying to figure out why, and just kind of directed my attention towards something else. But I maybe a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's so many people here that aren't like living here. So a huge percentage of the people that are in the occupying the space of Asheville are just um, people that are, you know, tourists or, or Airbnb -ers, people that are, <clears throat> you know, just transients that'll leave within an, a year. Um, and people that are kind of stationed here are, are trying to like desperately hold on to, to what they have. And uh, it's just kind of like a lot of other cities, but on a, almost a smaller scale where, um, you know, you have all these college students that are friends and then they'll, they'll start a house, a, a house venue and they'll, you know, be supporting each other's bands and it'll just kind of go in these cycles where those people, once they're out of school, will leave. And then the next cycle of people comes in and, and to them, we're like super old people, you know? Um, and so there, there isn't a, 
I don't know, just isn't a lot of interest in us. Like, I don't, I don't like, what else can I really I, say? I, I feel like, um, yeah, it, there's, there's a lack of community and it, it's for a lot of reasons. I think partially like what Scott was saying with it being a college town to a degree, um, this is probably horrid to say, but I think a lot of the people that run venues and retail businesses and all sorts of businesses in Asheville are catering to tourists and they're kind of being sellouts with things, you know, um, they're, they're not living up to the weirdness that Asheville is supposed to have. They're not really sticking their neck out for anything that's different that isn't going to make some money or sell a lot of beer. Um, so I think that that's something that's being combated and I don't know, maybe it's this way in other areas too, but I just feel like young people are spread so thin and I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just idealizing different eras thinking like. It sounds pretty similar to what's going on in Athens right now, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Which I know y'all played Athens at least once. That's where I saw y'all, which granted that was like, there was like two people that showed up, but that was also like the week of spring break. It was a week before the pandemic and like two of the bands were sick, which I guess was a premonition of what was to come. But... Yeah. yeah. I mean, like all those things may or may not have to do with people not being receptive to us. I mean, yeah. there, there are bands that do really well here that aren't college students. Mm-hmm. So like can't completely blame our view of Asheville and its opportunistic mindset on the fact that people aren't going to our shows. No. That could be so, something no. completely separate, but all, I just don't know, like, you know, I think just when it comes down to it, like they're just the type of mindset of people here doesn't really click with what we do. <clears throat> so yeah. maybe it's as simple as that. Yeah. Well, you said the environment means a lot to you and the, the area. So what does like Appalachia represent for you too? Personally, like, I think he has a deeper connection to the history and everything, but I just, hiking is such therapy for me. It's a way for me to, like, let my body and my mind work through whatever issues I'm having. Um, and it's it's been such a relief, and it even when I'm having an awful week, sometimes it's enough for me to be like, oh, yeah, there's a hike that I haven't seen, and... Like, I won't be able to experience that if I don't keep pushing forward, you know? Um, And just everything that grows here, I've said this a couple of times, but it's just like mother nature's womb, you know? There are more trees that grow in this area than all of Europe. And just like the fungi, and there's just so much life. And that's just super inspiring for me. It's very diverse and it's really, you know, the mountains are really old. The French Broad River is really old. It's just this really old energy that is really potent in terms of cleansing. Um, You know, I haven't, I just didn't have anything that could refresh my mind. And then, yeah, like going on hikes or camping, um, it's the only thing that can do that for me. And you just feel... your problems don't seem as big or you you don't, you know, things just don't seem to be as big of a deal when you're out there and you kind of gain that perspective of how, how small you are. And, um, I don't know. It's just the fact that you can constantly learn being out here there, there's so much to learn about. And to me, it feels relatively untouched for what it is and how, how, how large the space is. And, relatively unknown too you know i i didn't know much about appalachia prior to to hiking out here that one time and camping same um you know it, it had always been the rocky mountains and um i don't know if that has to do with like just midwestern mindset where it's always like going west going west okay. but um it's just this gem and it's so fertile and the you know the climate's super mild and yeah it's just really inspiring in so many different ways mm-hmm. I think it's interesting you say that, like, I guess y'all said for the Midwest, it was, you know, the Rockies and going West. Cause I'm from like really South Georgia. So it's like, I never, I've never heard anybody really say much about the Rockies, which I mean, I know generally with the U S what you know, all that represents, but like for your, I guess I always grow up hearing more about Appalachia and that area. 
So I guess it is a regional thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Colorado was a frequent vacation stop for us. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a lot of families that I knew that was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. that's interesting to learn i didn't realize that was kind of how i guess it makes sense that's the dynamics depending on what area the u.s is so big so right. yeah so scott you're self-trained as a musician right mm-hmm. all right so and you're more classically trained Lindsay. so how does that dynamic affect the way you two collaborate together to make music hmm. I think I'm a little bit of an asshole sometimes. <laughs> um, just coming from that kind of like, no, nope, it's done this way sort of mentality. Like I, I try to work on it. Um, and I think as a positive, I definitely um, have experience with drilling dynamics and having like things precision pretty well just like precision yeah. yeah execution although the refining qualities um Lindsay's able to implement and and um maybe i kind of keep things a little bit more open with my writing yeah but um i think because we like the same types of music and same musical approaches that's what works so well about it um but i mean even like like you would think language would would get in the way of of writing you know but it really it really doesn't we figured out how yeah. to communicate that um it it took some time and yeah i'm i'm definitely not a super rhythmic person um so to hear someone that has such a rhythmic sense like even over melody um that that's been an interesting challenge and um, communicating what those are. Sometimes I would just get flustered and just be like, Oh my gosh, I don't understand what you mean. Um, but that's also exactly why I love it because it pushes in that direction that I'm not familiar with. And um, just, he has such a unique ear for things that I have a feeling if you would have gone through a lot of training would have been pounded into submission. So yeah, I have this fear of like learning too many formulas to the point where it starts affecting the way you write. Um, and that can be conditioned, you know, to where you, you can't really break those chains. I, I just have this constant fear that if you just start using formulas and it's like, well, this is like how it's supposed to conclude or this should be the next chord in this progression because that just sounds right and that's just what you do. Yeah, then all of a sudden you start facing all these limitations. And so, I mean, I know enough to get me through what I'm doing and to communicate and, and where it's, it's not just like chaotic all over the place, like nonsensical, but um, yeah, learning too much theory, I think I, for me, it, it could be a detriment and wouldn't allow me to, to write based on like just what I'm hearing in my head, <clears throat> but I think um, what works well between us is like, I think I help Lindsay open her mind a little bit and she helps me really be hyper aware of everything that I'm doing at the same time. And so it's it's a good balance between that. And, and we push back and forth with that with the playing too, you know, we'll refine it as much as possible and then we'll kind of let loose yeah. when we, we'll, so we'll do practices where it's, um, a lot of refining everything and, and it's Ripping. precision and then and then we'll do a rehearsal where it's much more loose you mm-hmm. kind of just feel it a little bit more and so it's it's nice having that balance i know um for your first album all the lyrics are attributed to you scott so what sort of influence do you have on the lyrics Lindsay? i don't know if i do too much um i always know what this subject is going to be about before i've read what Ever he's working on. Um, he has a tendency to like mull over aloud what he's thinking about just conceptually, what issues he's having with the world or people or anything like that. And um, hiking, honestly, when we hike, we'll have a lot of conversations about those things and kind of play back and forth off of each other with ideas. So, I mean, maybe just being able to be 
a soundboard for that. Yeah. And she'll read them and everything as well. Like, well, you know, before they're completely finished because they always have to be, you know, somewhat adjusted to fit the format of a song. But um, yeah, there's always a lot of discussion. I mean, it's inevitable that there's going to be, there are going to be discussions regarding what I'm going to write at some point. So it's not as though I go into like a hole or like a closet and like write all these things and just come out with it. Like she's pretty, pretty aware of what's going on my, in my head with that. Just the <laughs> mental space that he's in and everything. I think it's pretty reflective of that, although it's sometimes a little like flowery over my head sometimes and I have to read it a couple of times through, but yeah. All right, so for the instrumental side of Okapi, how, what are y'all's roles in general for that? Do y'all, is it just purely collaborative or some parts usually take up, taken up for by one person over the other? Yeah, um, he always starts with his bass part before lyrics or anything, but he's normally writing that bass part around the same time that he's starting to come up with some form of poetry. Um, so he gets the bass part, figures out how to fit lyrics in however he wants, comes up with a crazy weird vocal melody. And then normally a good chunk of time passes <laughs> and then we'll um, revisit it. And I'll start listening to it, trying to come up with any ideas that I might have. Oftentimes he'll have sections where there's something crazy rhythmic going on with his part. And he's like, I hear this other crazy rhythm on top. And so I need to figure out how to make that work. Um, but a lot of the time, it's just me trying to find like some holes and some groove in between where the vocals and the bass are. Yeah, she definitely ties everything together. Um, makes it make sense, more sense. <laughs> um, it's a little less, less abstract, even though like her parts are really different too. But yeah, she'll, Lindsay will tie everything together but I'll, I'll usually have like a pretty good foundation, at least like with song structure and <clears throat> yeah, making sure that I can fit all the lyrics in, into a song. And then, I mean, she'll, she'll have heard it a couple of times by then as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, we'll usually have a discussion with what, what type of approach we're wanting to take with this and um, whether it's rhythmic or melodic or how aggressive it is or, you know, all these different intricacies and then we'll start writing with it which is kind of a a grueling process in and of itself yeah but yeah yeah and i think that's just because like he has a very firm idea of what he wants his parts to be and that's not really going to be adjusted very rare circumstance and then i end up getting in my head what i think can work with something um, and if they oppose, we just kind of will fight for what we're thinking, um, which we've always come to some conclusion. Like there isn't something that we've had to set on a shelf for a while or anything. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's two very opinionated people working on that sometimes, which can be interesting. Yeah, making decisions about something important to both of us. Yeah. And so we always find a common ground with yeah. that. Or we share similar, I mean, a lot of times we just sh share similar um, opinions too. So it works out. What made each of you decide to um, start learning your individual instruments way back whenever? Yeah. Um, my parents just signed me up for this like before school. We are interrupting your regularly scheduled program with an important announcement. Rural broadband sucks. Even a mild storm can abruptly end a friendly video chat. So write your senators or seize the broadband companies and expand internet services for everyone. Reform a revolution, take your pick, but do something. Hey, sorry. Hey. Yeah, I live in a really rural area and we have a storm nearby, so the internet spazzed out. <laughs> okay. I told him, I was like, I'm sure it's the weather. Yeah, I think it's that hurricane that's coming soon. So, or tomorrow or whenever. Wait. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So, um, I was, Lindsay was talking about her. Yeah, I, was, I think I asked um, what made y'all decide to pick up the individual instruments you did. And Lindsay, I got as far as you saying that um, 
that your parents put you in a um, before school class and then internet went out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, um, they enrolled me in that and I took it really seriously for whatever reason. Like I enjoyed it and was enthusiastic and just really liked it. So just kind of stuck with that. And um, yeah, I think it lasted longer because um, I was fortunate enough, maybe once I was in fourth grade onward to have an instructor that was really open-minded and would let me like play a lot of songs and learn a lot of different things that weren't um, the, the normal repertoire for classical. Um, so he was super supportive and I think that might have kind of been where I started to get the idea, which might not have been what he was aiming for, that um, you can push what instruments are seen as and what they're used for. And so that just kind of kind of kept going. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. And then um, was in a conservatory for a year and a half before realizing that like, I just, I couldn't be of the strict classical orchestral mind frame. I just, I can't not me <laughs> fair enough yeah i just uh i mean i wanted to be in a rock band and like i had a friend that played drums that was you know pretty good for whatever age it was and not a lot of people played bass and i liked corn and thought that sounded really cool with what fieldy was doing and it's like maybe i'd like to try that you know less competition and <clears throat> took some lessons and just didn't enjoy them just the routine and you know proving like trying to just for the sake of proving that you practiced you know for somebody else it's like that that's like what the motivation essentially was and um yeah I mean I it, it's not like I, I didn't have like a aha moment like oh my god like I love music like this is like my thing <laughs> um that kind of took took a, a little bit of time <clears throat> once I started like playing with people who share the same type of um, musical tastes and were at the same skill level that I could like grow with and everything. And then I just, I think turned more so into this desire to be creating all the time, you know, whether it was writing or writing like music or writing lyrics or reading and things like that. And the bass just happened to be the tool that I was using at the time. <clears throat> and so I just figured out ways to, to kind of, adapt it to whatever I, I felt like I needed to convey. And so it kind of, yeah, it turns out that I'm just not this traditional, um, I don't take like a traditional bass approach. So back then that was electric bass. So, and when I met Lindsay, I was still playing electric bass. So um, upright bass was like a newer development about um, about six years ago that I picked it up. So it was just kind of this, again, a circumstantial thing where you know, by chance, I picked up the electric bass and wanted to be an artist or had creative tendencies and stuck with bass for that reason and <clears throat> have learned to like kind of fall in love with it just based on how it's underrepresented as an instrument, I think, and trying to utilize it for capabilities that um, haven't been used, I guess. So have you either of you been involved in any musical projects other than Okapi since starting Okapi? Um, we tried out a couple of things. Like, independently um, with other. As much as I loved the people, um, I get really bored really fast. And that was the same with classical music if something wasn't directly pushing and challenging me enough um I, I just lose interest and I'm kind of a butthead about it that's why this has worked so well for so long because we don't really try to reel the other person in too much with spastic tendencies or anything um so we can it, it might be seen as incredibly indulgent but um we definitely are allowed to push ourselves. So, yeah. I mean, I think as like 
you know, it's just like old person talk, but I feel like as, as you get older, it's just, you're, you're much more conscious of how your time's being used. And I mean, it was hard, even when we played, we played with drummers too. And so even that it's like getting people to rehearse more than once a week was like nearly impossible, not super common um, for people. And so, you know, then you, you start finding yourself on the other side of the wall where you're like, okay, th this person in this group is wanting me to commit my time to their project. And I don't even really know if I'm that invested in it to begin with. I, I would much rather, like personally, I would much rather um, invest all my time in something that I'm working on that I believe in. And cause you know, don't have that much time in a day. And um, I know I was just fortunate enough to have Lindsay like really click with, with what I was initially starting that we could help grow together you know, because I was running into a lot of people that didn't want to, you know, they thought I was insane for wanting to practice more than once a week, you know, and I thought they were insane, but yeah, it's, I think it just didn't, I mean, just didn't click with the other projects, you know, and realizing the investment of time that people were expecting of you for their projects when really, I think we just enjoyed dedicating more time to what we were doing personally. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, before my internet goes out again, I guess we'll kind of start wrapping things up. So I kind of like, I like to end by asking the artists who, what's in, what's a local band from, or artist from your area that you want to, that you think deserves a little more attention or you want to spotlight, you know, share the love a little bit. What is Kima's project's name? I don't know. I would say, um, I mean, Lindsay can probably pick somebody. I would say um, there's a there's an artist, a, a puppeteer, and a performer named mm -hmm. Toybox that is really unique. Um, he, I mean, he's like a stage performer. He has he's this great. whole um, um, he's a cartoon witch getup, but he does a lot of really interesting things and is a really hard worker and you know travels and and one of the few artists that we can say really dedicates a lot of time to it, you know, and. It's super unique, just refreshing and unique and funny, but real. Yeah. I mean, it just puts like in a lot of effort. It's not just this, um, it's not just like a fun thing. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dedication, a lot of dedication, dedication, I'm just a really nice person. That's, that's helped us out here too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and like I was saying before with like the, the people and bands, it's just another person that we really, that we connect with, even though he's doing these, these performances and using puppets and doing animations and, um, and we're doing music, but yeah, I would say Toy Box. Yeah. Um, Kima Moore, I don't know what his, his project's name is, but he's an experimental, like, sound musician um but he will pick like a visual piece of art like a whole world scene i forget the artist that he really likes um but he will dive into that lay out this whole feel of this world and um i think it's pretty fascinating it's just a, a different way than it's like how a, i write um, things and yeah yeah. It's like a moving score to like a still piece. Yeah. So you're kind of like, he's helping you immerse yourself in the piece that he's immersed himself in. Totally. So he, yeah, he's like a sound artist. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And one of the sweetest guys that you'll like ever talk with. For sure. Yeah. Another person that's been really supportive of what we do too. Yeah. Definitely. That always helps. All right. Yeah. Um, so I guess just let the audience know, you know, plug yourself, social media, where to find your music, when the new album's going to come out, if you have an idea, anything like that. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. My internet cut out again toward the end, so Scott and Lindsay were unable to say their social media handles. So here it is now. You can find them at Bandcamp at okapiband.bandcamp.com, at Facebook at Okapi Duo, at YouTube at Okapi Duo, on IG at Okapi underscore Duo, and of course Spotify even SoundCloud, all that sort of stuff for their music. Thank you so much for listening.